So tell me, Nathan, what does it mean to be right or left brained? It's a wee bit of an urban legend, but it's also partially based in truth. Like there is a lot of truth to it. It just gets then oversimplified. Like when someone says to me, I'm a left brain person, I go, oh, really? Oh, that's awful. What happened to the other half? Because <laughs> like, um, really, you're supposed to have a whole brain. Um, but having said that, it is kind of true that the left brain is more associated with logical, procedural, um, and the right brain could be associated more with the big picture and intuition. You know, that's not untrue as well. It's just a sort of a simplification. The real science behind it gets a bit technical, that really human beings are all left-brained. That's, that's why we are intelligent and why we have a high IQ and why we have complex language is because we lateralized and used mainly the left-hand side of the brain. So most of your functions are in the left-hand side of the brain. Most of what you understand as language is in the left-hand side of the brain. So if someone has a stroke, and they damage the, you know, the Broca's area or the, the language areas in the left-hand brain, then they lose the ability to speak. But oftentimes those people can still sing because speaking is in the left-hand brain, but um, singing takes on much more of the right-hand brain. So it helps to support any left brain function that's left um, of language is because, because singing is more associated with right brain. Um, an oversimplification, but a good way to wrap your mind around it is they used to say jokingly that you could remove the left um, frontal cortex and the school teacher wouldn't notice because all the grades would stay the same. Oh, no, sorry, the right frontal cortex. Sorry, got that wrong. You could remove the right um, frontal cortex and the teacher wouldn't notice because just about everything the school measures is in the left frontal cortex. Um, but if you remove the right frontal cortex, all of their family would know because their personality would change completely. Now, that's a really bad metaphor because the teacher should know the personality of the child and would also notice. They don't just notice reading and writing, but you get the idea with that old-fashioned saying is that everything we do that's measured at school, um, all of language is predominantly in the left frontal cortex. So you could, if someone has a stroke in the left frontal cortex and they lose language and the ability to move and stuff, but they're still the same person behind that. They're just now in a ship that they can't control anymore but it's the same person. Whereas if you have a stroke in the right frontal cortex, that person can still speak, can still move, but their personality is completely changed and their family members will say it's like living with a different person. You know, so a lot of your personality and the flavor of you is in your right frontal cortex on your right brain, but all of your procedural stuff is in the left. And then they're joined up by this bridge in the middle so your, your brain, if you teleported your brain into my hands, you notice that it moves in two halves. It's not one whole ball. And those two halves are connected, the left and the right, and they're connected by this bridge of fibers in the middle. It's called the corpus callosum. But you can just think of it as a bridge of fibers that join the left and the right-hand brain, and it allows the left and the right-hand brain to communicate to each other. And so it integrates that stuff. Um, actually, a good story about the corpus callosum. They know that the corporate, that epilepsy, as a result of too much electrical activity happening in the corpus callosum, there's too much activity. And so in the 1960s, they did these experiments where they cut the corpus callosum, so stopped the left and the right brain and only communicate, just cut it completely. And that seemed to cure epilepsy um, for a lot of people. But a certain percentage of the participants, um, it seemed all fine a week or so after the operation, because the left and the right brain are only a week apart. They sort of know what the other one is doing. So there's still coherency. But for some of those people, as they as time went on, they developed two completely distinctly different personalities, a very left brain logical personality and a very right brain emotional, spiritually connected, we all are one type personality. Um, in lots of ways, you could see that all of us are, what we think of as our one personality, is really a very sort of left brain, almost autistic, um, logical, detached from emotion personality and a right brain, very connected, emotional, intuitive. And they're connected via the, integrated via the corpus callosum into what we think of as our one personality. But, you know, really it's made up of those two sides of the brain. But um, the corpus callosum in a female is much denser typically than it is in a male. So you start to get into that gender difference. Like we talk about women being able to multitask. And that's probably a lot of that will be down to this corpus callosum and how the left and the right brain functions. From a cognitive or a neuroscience point of view, women don't really multitask. That's not the academic term we would use because multitask is saying that she's doing using the right brain and the left brain at the same time. Whereas what you see on a brain scan is that actually 
a woman's able to go from a right brain to left brain, back to the right brain, back to the left brain at a very, very fast speed. And it's, if you think of the corpus callosum as being a bridge that joins the left and the right-hand brain, women have like a major six-lane highway, like the German autobahn that has no speed limits and no traffic jams. And if some women have a six-lane highway, men have a swing bridge at the back with a few planks missing. So there isn't the, the, the ability to go from left to right so quickly. So you don't have a stereotype of men multitasking. What I'm saying is academically, women aren't multitasking. They're just going from a left brain function to a right brain function back to a left brain function so fast that it looks like multi, you know, multitasking. But we would call it cognitive flexibility. They've got the flexibility to move from a right brain function to a left brain function. So if I say to you, just humor me and sing along with me the words to bye bye Miss American Pie. So we go bye bye Miss American Pie. I drove my Chevy to the levee, but the levee was dry. Singing good old boys, what's eight times four? So the people that were able to go from reciting poetry that they don't really know the words to, but you probably do know the words because we've know the words to a thousand songs that we don't think we know the words to. So you just kind of do know the words, but it's more intuitive. That's a very right brain function. And then eight times four is a mathematical equation that only has one right answer. So it's very left brain. So the people that were able to go, Joe my Chevy to the Levy 32, have got very good cognitive flexibility and have got a good corpus callosum probably. They can jump from one to the other really quickly. The people who are still right now singing Bye Bye with some American Pie, they, they might want to work on that. Because um, that's, uh, yeah, not good cognitive flexibility. How do you work um, on that then? If you're listening going, oh, oh dear. Well, it's like, any, it's like anything else in the brain. It's, um, it's practice. You know, your brain responds to what's happening in the environment. So if you practice tasks which make you use cognitive flexibility, it's like going to the gym. You know, we could all have abs if we really, really wanted to. The science is there. You go to the gym every day and you do the ab exercises and you have abs. Um, but most of us don't have abs because it's just the knowledge of knowing to do it um, doesn't necessarily mean that we do it. But yeah, you could easily improve your brain. There's ways that, the, uh, you know, your cognitive flexibility. What's interesting to me is how do you make the corpus callosum thicker? Because when you're an adult, it doesn't really change in physical density. But under the age of seven, you've got much more neuroplasticity. So... There's research that shows boys who learn a musical instrument, because music does magic stuff to the brain. Um, boys that start to learn a musical instrument before the age of seven, that seems to stimulate the growth of their corpus callosum. So they have corpus callosums that are similar to females. That would make me hypothesize that because it's so the corpus callosum is so involved in emotional intelligence, because it's about integrating emotion, that probably boys that start to learn a musical instrument before the age of seven, I would imagine would be more emotionally intelligent than the average man would be more like a female because they have a corpus callosum. I mean, that's a simplification. That's why I say it's only a hypothesis, but, you know, it correlates. Mm. But anyway, that left and right brain stuff. Um, so, you know, there is some gender difference. But the point I was originally making was that males and females still spend most of their time in the left-hand brain. You know, if they didn't, then we wouldn't be human. You know, people might be thinking now, Oh, well, if we learn to use the right-hand brain as much as the left-hand brain, we'd, you know, be even flasher. It's like, no, we wouldn't. Then we'd be like monkeys because monkeys use them in a much more equal way. And that's why they don't have language and advanced cognition and high IQ. The whole reason we have all of that is because we lateralize to use one side of the brain more than the other. It's what creates higher intelligence. The difference in gender is that females do go over to the right hand side of the brain and back to the left much more often than males do. So males and females brains are operating in the same way. We're mainly left brain creatures, but females, not every single female against every single male, just over a population of 100, we will see the trend that females typically go over to the right brain and back to the left much more often than males do. And it's even down to a speed thing. Females go to the right hand side of the brain and come back to the left hand side of the brain at the same speed. Men match that speed when we go from the left brain to the right brain, so we're just as fast as getting there, but we can only seem to be able to come back at about half the speed. It's like we go to the right-hand brain, get lost, refuse to ask the directions, and so it takes twice as long to get back. <laughs> so <laughs> we just don't bother taking the journey in the first place and stay pretty much on the left-hand side of the brain. So then you get the stereotype that when mum and dad have watched the rugby, by the end of watching the rugby, mum's watched the rugby, but she's also put on the washing and peeled the potatoes for tea, whereas dad's just achieved having watched the rugby because he's, his brain's not as designed to multitask. So there is a gender difference, but it's just the danger of oversimplifying it because you might have a more male brain and I might have a more female brain with us two as individuals because it's only population data. 
it's like that with the construction agenda. It's very cultural agenda, not so much of it's in your brain. Um, and your brain doesn't dictate what your gender is. It's almost like they're a, it's a circular model. They, they interface with each other. So if you're raised in an environment where you're very, very encouraged to be competitive and physical and spatial and all things we might associate with male, then you'd be very different female than if you're in an environment where you're encouraged to communicate and to remain still and not very and not focus much on movement and you know the more traditional girl stuff an environment then changes your brain you know um practice becomes biology so what you practice over and over again becomes the actual biology of your brain it's so your brain's not in charge of you yeah it's more you're in charge of your brain by what you do which I think more of us, if we realise that, things life would be a little bit easier, right? Yeah, it is, it is helpful knowing that brain stuff to know that anything your brain sort of does 90 times or like for three months, it then does change. So if you want to be a morning person, um, it's deceptively easy to change your personality. If you get up, you have to fake it for three months. You get up and go, oh, yay, it's morning. Oh, I love mornings, you know, and you convince <laughs> yourself that you love it. You will only have to fake that for 90 times. And then your brain would have changed so that you are a morning person. You would, you know, leap out of bed. But who has the motivation to do that 90 times in a row? <laughs> Not many people. Sadly. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying it does actually, your brain does change relatively easy if you could force yourself into the practice of changing it. It just takes time. You can't do it once or twice. Yep. You have to do it. It works through repetition. So we were speaking a lot about, you know, uh, physiologically there is a difference between the genders kind of but yep. instead of assigning a side to gender should it be more associated with qualities like the more scientific minded individuals or the creatives yeah 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 that's right it is the more scientific logical person we could associate more as a left brain type of person as long as we're not oversimplifying in our head that that means they don't have a right brain or they don't use the right brain um and yeah a, a creative person is more right brained i think it's often about getting the balance though you know, you're kind of born genetically predisposed to one. If you did work really well at school and found school not that difficult and always passed, you're probably quite a left brain person because school's quite suited to left brain people. If you're a right brain genius and your gift is music or your gift is spatial or school probably missed it, <laughs> like, you know, um, school's really focused on that left stuff. But I think a lot of our brilliance is around actually going to your weaker side and strengthening that. So yeah. I found school quite easy. So I got the left brain stuff, but I couldn't um, perform on stage without my right brain because that's the ability to connect to people and stuff. And if you were just left brain, you'd be a little academic in an ivory tower that no one's listening to. Yeah. Um, but you've got all the qualifications and the letters after you. So the ability to connect with audiences and translate stuff into meaningful, you know, translate research into meaningful stuff, a heaps of that is right brain. So I think it's the reason I've been successful in my career is because of the left brain qualifications and going to university and being an expert in that stuff. But there's lots of experts in that stuff that don't have the same success. I think a lot of my success is because I also studied drama and played theater sports and um, was quite creative and theatrical. And um, so I think it's that brought my right brain online as well. Jing sort of gave me the left brain, but I think those environmental things then gave me a right brain and everyone does a whole lot better with the whole brain. <laughs> like yeah. so yeah it's good to recognize your strength but i think it's actually a lot of times i have presenters come to me and ask about how to be a better presenter um and they want me to give them advice and i think they think it's going to be all sort of left brain advice like you should use the do this with your slides or introduce yourself this way and you can give them some pointers like that but nine times out of ten what i tell people who they already understand their topic really well they're only going to be able to teach to the audience about one percent of what they know and so actually, sometimes that other 99% is a hindrance because they try and put in too much information and then disengage the audience. Um, so I think it's as much about storytelling as it is about giving information. So nine times out of 10, I send those people to play theatre sports for six months. You need to get out of your left brain and out of this linear way of thinking and information based what the audience should know and realise you need to engage the audience. You need to take them on a journey. You need to have an exchange of energy. And that's all right brain stuff. So there's nothing I know that gets your right brain online as fast as theatre sports. If you know, you know theatre sports, that show whose line yeah. is it anyway? Yeah. yeah because great. you have to improvise. So when I say, 
okay, make up a song now about your mother eating baked beans in the shower. You just have to go bang and make up a country and western song about your mother. So you just have to go, mum's eating baked beans in the shower and just go. Um, and you make a dick of yourself. You know, you're, um, you're not that good at it for a start. Um, even when you're good at it, it only comes off one in five times. But it just does magic stuff to the brain in terms of making you go with that creative. It's like a muscle. You're exercising that creativity. And it's amazing the genius stuff that your right brain will throw up, but we often don't use it because we're so focused on left brain, analytical, the order. So, yeah, I think they become a 10 times better presenter when they go and play theatre sports for six months. So that's not directly applying it to what they're doing. It's just bringing their right brain online and then they will naturally be a better presenter. It's so interesting because I, you know, I, I've got one child that's more left brain, I think, and the other that's more right brain. Um, right. And it's, it's an interesting thing to sort of look at as a parent, I guess, and know that knowledge. But how can we help our children that are that way? You know, that are obviously opposite, but, you know, um, maybe more yep. left brain or maybe more right brained and how we can get them to I use think, both sides of the brain. I think it's for a start, it's giving them opportunities to flourish. So you've got a, a left brain kid has got school to flourish. So they will do well at school. Um, the right brain kid is what I would make sure that they are allowed to study music, that they're allowed to do drama, that they're given things that school treats as second rate, but are actually just as important, you know, like, um, so they can shine. So they understand, oh, I might not be doing well at engineering, but I'm an amazing singer. So their self-esteem, yeah. Because I think that's how you compensate. You make sure they have environments where they are able to flourish in their right brain. Because right brain people often do struggle at school. And the worst thing, you, the worst outcome is for them to go, oh, I'm a bit dumb. Other people are clever and I'm not. Whereas they bloody are so. They're just not clever in a way that school is captured. Yeah. Mm. Because I think, you know, knowing your strengths, whether you're more stronger left brain or right brain, it has to help you with your yeah. future career choices and help you capitalize on how your brain works, I guess. And yeah. realize yeah. your weaknesses and improve those strengths. That's right. There are some cheat sheet ways to get your left brain on for all the right brains out there who are musos and stuff and they go to study and they can't bloody remember anything and their brain just won't apply to it and stuff. Um, that's about your executive functions. So your executive functions are in the left prefrontal cortex that really determine how brainy someone is in terms of um, how well they do at school brainy. Um, and you could, you know, when you look up Google executive functions, you'll get like 65 of them. But essentially there's four main executive functions. They are um, self-control, we've already talked about one, um, cognitive flexibility, that ability to go from left to right brain. So your yeah, self-control, cognitive flexibility, working memory, and metacognition, right? If you strengthen those four, and all of them are quite easy to strengthen, some of them you can play video games and strengthen those functions, um, that is at the basis of what makes you left brain brainy. So then when you have those, you can play video games and strengthen those four things for a few months, and then when you go to do schoolwork, you'll be able to do it all and you'll be able to remember and you'll be able to do the maths. And because it's not really about how brainy you are, it's about how well those executive functions are online. Like working memory is how many mental balls you can juggle in the head in one go. So if I say to you, remember the numbers 17 and 19, that's only two numbers to remember. That doesn't require much working memory at all. You don't need any strategies or anything. You can just sort of park those numbers up there in your head and leave them there. So if I ask you, what were those numbers? you are able to recall those numbers. But if I say now, remember those two numbers and also remember the number 32, now when we go to three on the working memory, that starts to exercise the working memory. It's not just easy and automatic pilot. So most people now have to employ a strategy and most people will employ the strategy of repetition. I start to say the three numbers over and over again. Is that what you were doing? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to ask you what the numbers are so you can let go of the numbers right I'm just trying to demonstrate what working memory is that with so everyone's got a working memory with one, one, not everyone but most people have a working memory with two is not difficult three you have to employ some strategies um, most of us don't need a working memory of four so we if we don't naturally have that in our gene sort of thing then we don't go up there but if you get a mass class you get the bottom mass class the middle mass class and the top mass class overwhelmingly you will find that the bottom mass class have a working memory of um, you know two to three and the middle mass class have a working memory of three to four and the top mass class have a working memory of five to six um, and so you can play video games you can play that card game memory play that all day and your working memory will have improved by the end of the day you know you can play video games um, that what was that one that everyone was playing Lumina um, it was from Harvard University and then they worked with that San Francisco Luminosity, 
So it was a computer game everyone was playing, that improves your working memory. So you can move your working memory from two, and then you're going to find it quite difficult to go and do academic study and stuff because you only can really hold on to two mental balls at once. But that is like a muscle that you exercise. Then you can go and learn this, you know, get a working memory of six. And then suddenly when you can juggle six balls in your head, you can do quite a more advanced maths than you could when you could only juggle two. So it's not really cleverness in total. It's just a set of muscles, these executive functions, and you can strengthen those executive functions. So right brain people that want to apply themselves to study, just strengthen those. You know, we talked about cognitive flexibility. That's the ability to switch from a right brain function to a left brain function. Then working memory is a number of mental balls you can juggle in your head. I said one of them was metacognition. Uh, metacognition is what we've been doing this whole conversation. Cognition is just an academic word for thinking. So 100% of the time you hear the word cognition, you can just change it to thinking, and that's what it means. Um, meta means effectively studying or thinking about. Meta means thinking about. So And cognition means thinking. So metacognition is thinking about thinking. You know, like if you like, a monkey can think, but a monkey can't think about how they think, whether they're an auditory learner or a cassette learner. That ability to think about how you think is a really highly developed frontal cortex function that humans have. So if I say, you know, if like over 70% of people at university leave it to the last 48 hours to write the essay, don't do it, you know, two weeks before. So let's say we've left it to the last 24 hours and the essay is due tomorrow. Would you be better off to stay up all night writing the essay? Would, or would you be better off to go to bed early, set your alarm and get up at the crack of dawn and write the essay? Like, are you a morning person or a night person when it comes to that? Me personally? Yeah. I'm, a, yeah. I'm usually a morning person, but... Yep. In that sort of stressful situation, I'd probably be an all-night person. <laughs> right, yeah, you might just out of necessity do it all night. But um, so I, I worked out pretty early on at university. If I stayed up all night and wrote it, I um, mean, you know, I could spend the same amount of time, you know, wrote, stayed up four hours and wrote the essay, I'd get a C plus. If I got up first thing in the morning, spent four hours writing it, I'd get a B plus. My brain is just sharper in the morning and did that yeah. stuff better. So knowing that is metacognition, knowing how you learn as a learner, knowing that... Um, in a cold room, I don't go anywhere near as fast in essay writing as I do in a warm room. So to pump the heat pump up another point before I start writing will make my time way more productive. That's metacognition. Mm. If I was going to do a unit on metacognition in primary school, you'd call it knowing yourself as a learner. Because that's what metacognition is, knowing how you learn. So it's one of the executive functions. If you know how you learn, you can harness that and learn way faster. You know, if you know you're a visual learner or whatever. Mm -hmm. I think that's half the trouble with our children. They just don't learn the way they're being taught, but they, you know, they don't know how the best way for them to learn is. And teachers yeah. are so busy in classrooms now that, you know, I guess it's hard for them to be able to adapt to every single student's type of learning. But I think if children sort of know that mm -hmm. they're not very good at the auditory, that they're more a visual learner or whatever else, yeah. they can know that themselves. So it is quite... I think you will learn. see, you will see much more of that in new curriculum developments because there's so much of this research behind executive functions and metacognition that gives it a whole lot of creed and status because it's one of the top executive functions. So we know it's one of the things that makes kids intelligent. So we've redeveloped the primary school curriculum here in New Zealand. So there's a new curriculum coming out. Um, and I know that metacognition, because of that research, features much more predominantly. You know, as, and, and I think it's always been there that it figures much more predominantly. So I think you'll find the same thing because, you know, your curriculum uh, reviews and development are driven by research and that research is very, is quite strong. So I think you'll see it just without even trying. It'll just naturally come through in your curriculum developments. You will see more focus on metacognition, I think. Yeah, in Australia, that'd be great because is it true that we only use 10% of our brain's capacity? No, that's just one of those urban myths that just got went, got on fire and... Um, Einstein didn't say it either. <laughs> like, um, yeah, it does speak to a certain truth that we don't know what the human potential is. We don't know what the brain's entire function is, you know? Um, imagine if, you know, a group of people that had never had any technology stumbled across a Ferrari. They would think it was amazing, but they'd probably attach some ox to it and pull it around and be really, really impressed with how good the wheels are and how good the suspension is and stuff and think they've just discovered this amazing thing, never even knowing that actually it's a bloody Ferrari, it can go <laughs> hundreds of miles an hour. Maybe the brain's like that, because we, don't, we know there's no part of the brain that we don't know what it does, 
that every part of the brain does so many multiple things and works so much through systems where you know these five different parts of the brain connect for that system to do this that it's limitless the amount of connections that it can make sort of thing. so we don't know what the potential is maybe we've got a ferrari that we're pulling around with oxes <laughs> like, I, I hope so because i think uh, you know before children i think i was a lot more intelligent now i'm just uh, like smashed avocado right. i call it <laughs> right well there's interesting neuroscience behind that too because you've got children it's strengthened the social emotional networks in your brain you need to be able to emotionally connect you need to be able to your kids don't have the skills to tell you what's going on for them so you need to have a strong intuition you've got to be strongly attuned to other human beings to be able to pick up on that intuition and meet your kids needs so nature would not be doing you much of a service if they cut all that off and just made you really good at balancing the checkbook and remembering where your car keys are and being analytical because that would not make you that good a parent that would make you a detached parent and make your children feel um, alone so so it's actually a good thing that nature steals some of your ability to check your to balance your checkbook and so you forget where your car keys are um, but your intuition and your emotional connection and your, you know, all the things that you actually really need as a parent are strengthened as a result of that. That's what nappy brain is, really. You've made me feel a lot better about my parenting right now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I think it's just true that nappy brain gets a bad rap, but it's like, mate, your brain's not against you. Your brain is always trying to do the very best thing for you. And so nappy brain is a wonderful gift that allows you to emotionally connect with your children. Is it, that's so true. It's like probably one of the biggest ahas I've gotten from interviewing someone with pod, through the podcast all these years. And um, yeah, no, thank you for that little insight because uh, oh. it is parents, you know, especially working parents, we sometimes give ourselves pretty hard time going, where's my brain going? I don't even know. It's just. It's yeah, not. yeah, yeah. But your brain's so multifaceted. There's just a part of your brain, the analytical part, that's not as strong as it was, but other parts of your brain are so much stronger. Yeah, it's. it's very, very true. You've hit me in the in the heart today, so thank you. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> so um, we have the research has found going back to the kids now that the first seven years yep. of a child's life definitely determine to a large extent um, their life experience. So what are your thought? What are your thoughts on this? Like, if a child's experience hasn't been positive, um, how can we overcome these setbacks? I guess if they've their first okay. seven years haven't been. The first thought that comes into my mind is that saying it's hundreds of years old it probably needs to be updated to the first thousand days now rather than seven years okay. um you know give me the child in the winter and when they're a thousand days old we can predict statistically with a high degree of accuracy most of your outcomes from a neuroplasticity of brain development point of view most of your brain's growing in that first thousand days and after three it doesn't grow bugger all really it only grows a little bit that's why three-year-olds have big heads have you put a jersey on a three-year-old recently <laughs> we're out there because they've basically got an adult size head. Don't they? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they've got an adult size head because most of your brain grows in the first thousand days. So by three, they've got this kind of nearly adult size head, but only a tiny little body. Um, so yeah, I'm just saying, I mean, there's still, still lots of research relevance to having seven as an age too. I'm just saying that actually you could take it even further back than that. Other researchers would argue it's by the age of one. Other, actually, statistically, we can predict a whole lot of the children's outcomes when they're still in the womb, just based on their mother's statistics. So. You know, research can really can inform us but from a brain development point of view it's the first thousand days i think when we take into account social emotional development and gender development and all of that more social stuff then it's probably seven's more fear it's not just the brain it's about who you are as a person um but like you say the crux of the question what if you had a if what if it completely sucked your um, first thousand days or your first seven years um i always like to quote a famous educational theorist here that everyone can relate to can we fix it Yes, we can. That's Bob, the, <laughs> that's Bob the Builder for all the less cultured people here. Um, but um, yeah, the can we fix it? Yes, we can. The reason we can predict your outcomes from a really early age is because the majority of people do not receive an intervention. So um, if you were living a, you know, what's the way of saying the most horrible, revolting, you know, um, gang abuse, violence, you know, over here, I'd say Once for Warriors, because that's a famous movie that just depicted all of that violence. Do you guys know Once for Warriors? Yeah. I'm sure you've got your equivalent. Yeah, yeah. So if you had a Once for Warriors first thousand days, can we fix it? Yes, we can. The reason we can predict your outcomes at three is because the vast majority of children who come from a Once for Warriors first thousand days will continue to live that until they're 18. So that's why we can predict their outcomes, because there's no intervention. If you go and adopt that child at 3,000 days old, and or at seven, 
and you take them into a loving, nurturing, caring home, absolutely the brain's going to change and the brain's going to respond to that. That says um, temperament plus personality equals, oh no, sorry, temperament plus experience equals personality. So your personality is a combination of the temperament you were born with and the experience you've had. And because you can change your experience quite easily, that means you can change your personality quite easily because it's a result of the combination of your temperament and your experience. So put glibly, if we took you to death row now and locked you up on death row and left you there, your personality would change immensely. You know, if we put you in jail, because you'd be in a way different environment, so your personality would radically change, but who you are as a person, your temperament would remain completely consistent. Your temperament doesn't change throughout your whole life. We can measure traits of your temperament from the day you're born. You know, the, um, there's, there's famous researchers of Thomas and Chess and the research is around temperament. I think they've got nine different traits that you can measure. You know, um, like for instance, if I say to you, imagine that you're on holiday, you're at a tropical island, you're at the pool, right? Palm trees, sun is blazing. It's your ideal tropical island holiday at the pool, right? Just visualize that. You've got a clear vision of that. And then I'll say to the audience, okay, one of the temperament traits we measure is level of physical activity. Now, I never told you whether there was physical activity or not in that. So if you immediately have pictured yourself swimming in the pool, you've probably got a temperament trait of being quite physically active. Um, if you immediately pictured yourself drinking a pina colada on a sun deck or a sun lounger, I'm probably not so active, right? And because I didn't mention those things, so that'll give us an indication of your temperament, which of those did you place yourself as doing? Um, things like adaptability to change, you can even measure that down to the way they adapt to light. You know, some kids' eyes will dilate very quickly when the light goes on and adapt to it in a couple of seconds. Other kids will take, you know, seven, ten seconds. Um, your adaptability to change seems to be hardwired in as part of your temperament and genes. So your temperament remains consistent. But what I'm saying is you can change your personality easy as. <laughs> like it is just about, you know, the older it is, the harder it is, but it's about just changing the environment. There's, there's lots of stuff in there. Um, because your diet also affects how quickly you can change your brain. If you're trying to get over a difficult childhood, change your way of being, which we all do all the time. It's called growing up, you know. You can't get away with that like a teenager for the rest of your life. We all had to change with, you know. So your brain is, for everyone, is always changing. But the four things that you can put in your mouth that will slow that down and make it a whole lot harder, you can remember with the anagram CATS, C-A-T-S, it's caffeine, alcohol, tobacco, and sugar. They're the four things that reduce your neuroplasticity. So if you've had a stroke and you want your brain to heal fast, I would reduce your caffeine, alcohol, tobacco, and sugar because the more neuroplasticity you've got, the faster you'll heal. If you're trying to bring about behavior change and respond in different ways, you want to establish new behaviors and stuff, where that could be, you know, not lashing out and getting violent. It could be stopping cigarette smoking or any behavior change. You're going to need neuroplasticity. So the less caffeine, alcohol, tobacco, and sugar you have, probably the more neuroplasticity you've got, and the faster that behavior change will stick. So interesting, isn't it? Yeah, well, you just learn lots about, yeah, and, and you know, because originally I worked in sort of more psychology fields, but then as a counselor and a trauma person, it's interesting getting the brain development knowledge and then overlaying it over that knowledge mm. um, and how they interface. Yeah. Because I guess so many children, you know, they're having caffeine, like Coca-Cola at such a young age now. And so yeah. much now, hopefully they're not having so energy drinks. tobacco. But, um, yeah. but they're having energy drinks, which are loaded with caffeine and sugar. Yeah, which absolutely. Is, you know, yeah. Yeah. It shows while we're having so many behavioral issues and different things like that, I guess. In yeah, society, yeah. Our children. Yep, yep. It's interesting, hey, because it all... When people are saturating their brain with any addictive thing, whether it's sugar or caffeine or alcohol or, mar or drugs or, you know, addiction, what is addiction? What is that brain's ability? Why is the brain trying to drown itself like that? Really, all of, I find all addiction comes back to trauma. Um, the brain has been traumatized at some stage. And so it's trying to quell that trauma with whatever it's drowning itself in, whether that's caffeine, alcohol, tobacco, sugar, drugs relationship, sex, you know, whatever it is that they're drowning themselves in to get this endorphin fix, it's usually covering up trauma. And so, and like we said, the brain's quite easy to fix. So if you face up to that trauma, um, it generally fixes, you know, and, how, and quells the addiction. But we're getting a bit deep and meaningful there, but, you know, <laughs> I've just yeah. find in my workshop. Days, you say 90 days, we've got to do something for it to be to change. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. It is. And trauma is so interesting on the brain because the part of the brain that's traumatized is the emotional brain and the emotional brain is not logical. So the things that traumatize people are not what you think because they're not logical. They're things that logically you shouldn't have been traumatized, but yeah, you know, because you just happened at the wrong time. So most people are not traumatized by their mother leaving them too early at primary school, but there'll be some kid out there that got major trauma because the developmental stage he was at, that was just happened to be the wrong day and something as little as that triggered and that that emotional response in his brain and he gets post-traumatic stress disorder as a result of being left too early at school. Well, yeah, that would only happen one in a million times. I'm just saying it's not a logical thing. Yeah. You know, a lot of trauma is logical. Kids that are sexually abused, kids that are beaten and stuff, there's logical reasons for being traumatised. But I'm saying a lot of people, if they have addictions, they might not have an identifiable trauma, like I was abused as a child, or so they might not understand it, but it could have been something like that. Um, you know, it could have been something that you're... you're I always think of the emotional brain as being like a two-year-old. They have the logic of a two-year-old. So the two-year-old can decide that the wind is scary and they've got to be scared of the wind and they don't need any rational bloody reason for it. So understanding your trauma response is the same thing. So heaps of it is identifying what is the trauma. Which mm. I think we should do in another podcast. Mm. I get some positive results with NLP, which is interesting because you wouldn't super support that with neuroscience. I've seen really positive outcomes from it. it. It correlates a wee bit with neuroscience, so you can use some neuroscience to support it, but you couldn't say that NLP is completely supported by neuroscience because it's much more about the mind, NLP, than it is about the brain. Um, yeah, they're doing a lot of studies and they've got a lot of different ways that they're trying to treat trauma, trauma these days. I think even um, mm. uh, psychedelics and all sorts of things they're talking about. Yeah, case. and they have really good results with psychedelics. It's a fascinating area of research. I think people are so associate drug abuse with psychedelics that they can't separate the fact that the medicinal part of it from the drug abuse part of it. That's mm. our bloody parents' fault, swinging hippies from the 60s who abused all the drugs. Gave us all these restrictive laws. And actually, it's <laughs> some of them are miracle responses to um, trauma and stuff, eh? Mm. Yes, mm. No, there's so, so many interesting things. I think we have to do another podcast on, on that sort of um, discussion, though. Um, mm. Yeah, we'll be doing it off a bit. Oh, that's all right. I love chatting to you because uh, the brain is such an, a huge topic for us to discuss. So any yeah. parting words, if we go back to left and right brain, any yeah. parting words for parents right now listening uh, that have, you know, this left or right brain favoured child out there? Yep. Yeah. Um, just make sure that you celebrate which side of the brain your child lives in. Um, and then do what you can to gently support them to encourage the growth and development of the other side of their brain. Not just for the right-brained kid who needs to do well at school as well, but for the left-brained kid who also needs to be better at intuition and connecting with other people and empathy. Um, so everybody benefits from strengthening that other side. If we had a good school curriculum, um, you know, music would be as compulsory as reading and writing because like, you know, like we discussed, really so much of school is about the left um, brain and so much about our experience as being a human is in the right brain so i'd encourage everyone to try and develop both if school's only developing one then compensate put your kids into music lessons get your kids into theater yeah fantastic advice and mums you can stop giving your hard, yourselves a hard time that you're more right brain these days it's, it's a good thing <laughs> <laughs> it is yeah Perfect. Uh, to find out more, go and check out Nathan Wallace. That's W A L L I S dot com. Nathan, thank you so much for being on the show today. It's always Cheers. so insightful right. having you. And um, yeah, thanks for asking. Definitely me. got my brain. Definitely got both my sides of my brain working today. So thank you. Ah, great. Excellent. <laughs> Cheers, mate.